This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Realize. Knight errantry, feudal loyalty, or a primitive patriotism. If the emphasis on material motives in this book may sometimes seem excessive, it is partly because their role has been underestimated in popular accounts of the Hundred Years' War, and partly because recent research has given us much more information about the extent and nature of spoils won in France, and how they were spent in England. Whatever the motives, a sustained, and on the whole extraordinarily successful offensive, was waged for over a century by a poor and scantily populated little country against a richer, more populous, and ostensibly far more powerful enemy. It is arguable that the Hundred Years' War was medieval England's greatest achievement. 1. Valois or Plantagenet 1328-1340 Dare he command a fealty in me? Tell him the crown that he usurps is mine, and where he sets his foot he ought to kneel. Tis not a petty dukedom that I claim, but all the whole dominions of the realm, which if with grudging he refuse to yield, I'll take away those borrowed plumes of his, and send him naked to the wilderness. The Reign of King Edward III Sir, does it not seem to you that the silken thread encompassing France is broken? Sir Geoffrey Scrope On the first day of February 1328, King Charles IV of France, third son of King Philip the Handsome and last of the Capetian dynasty, lay dying. He had no children, but his wife was pregnant. On his deathbed Charles said, If the queen bears a son, he will be king, but if she bears a daughter, then the crown belongs to Philip of Valois. Philip, Count of Valois, Anjou, and Men, was thirty-five, a tall, handsome nobleman who was famous for magnificence and for prowess in the tournament and on the battlefield. He was a great-grandson of St. Louis and King Charles's first cousin. His father, Charles of Valois, had not only been a prince of the blood royal, but also, because of his second wife, titular emperor of Constantinople, while Philip's mother had been a daughter of the Capetian house which ruled Naples. He had inherited vast wealth and estates. Cold and calculating, he was very different from the flashy and incapable knight-errant of popular tradition. On All Fool's Day, 1328, the widowed queen gave birth to a posthumous daughter. Philip at once summoned a well-chosen assembly to Paris, who swiftly acknowledged him as their king, Philip VI. They did not know how much misery and destruction they had thereby brought upon France. Across the Channel, an even more dramatic scene took place two years later. Parliament had met at Nottingham in October 1330, and Isabel, the Queen Mother, and her lover, Roger Mortimer, Earl of March, who was the real ruler of England, had taken up residence in the castle. On a dark night, the eighteen-year-old King Edward III and a band of young lords entered the fortress through a secret passage, and, after cutting down the guards, burst into the pregnant Queen Isabel's bedchamber to seize Mortimer. Edward personally broke down the door with a battle-axe, though he tried to avoid being seen by his mother. Despite Isabel's plea, "'Fair son, fair son, have pity on gentle Mortimer!' Roger was hanged, drawn, and quartered on the common gallows at Tyburn. The young king had at last won control of his kingdom. Edward had every reason to hate both Mortimer and his mother. The she-wolf of France seems always to have despised her husband, Edward II, the loser at Bannockburn, a particularly inept ruler and a reputed homosexual. In 1326, she and Mortimer had forced Edward to abdicate, replacing him with his son as a puppet monarch. A year later, the deposed king was horribly murdered, being buggered with a red-hot poker. Mortimer, perhaps the nastiest man ever to rule England, had governed by fear. Not only had he killed Edward II, but he had tricked his brother, the Earl of Kent, into a conspiracy and then legally murdered him. 
To cap everything, he had got the Queen Mother with child. However, Edward was merciful to Isabel, allowing her to withdraw to Wellington.